All right, Daniel, are we ready? Go ahead. We're good? All right, everyone, you guys ready? Yes? Woo! All right. All right, everyone, so in case you don't know uh, what's happening now, um, one of the requirements, um, one of the only requirements really required of me to graduate from this school um, is I had to write a thesis uh, that answers three prompts and um, present it to school meeting and defend it there and then present it to all of you here today. Um, so the three prompts I have to answer are why did I come here, um, what I learned while I was here, and what I'm doing next. So I would just like to get right into it. So first of all, thank you all so much for being here. There's so many people out there. Um, so many of you, each one of you, all hold a special place in my journey and helped me out at some point during my time here. And um, it's just really, really humbling to see you all out here. So thank you all so much for coming. So this is my thesis, my thesis, figuring things out for myself. Hi, my name is Gavin Mealy. Many of you may know me, some of you may not know me. I was born on February 16th, 2004, making me 18 years old now. I have no siblings. Although I have moved homes more than most people my age have, I have lived in towns in the greater Philadelphia area for my whole life, never moving too far from wherever I'm moving from. I've been a student at South Jersey Sudbury School for nearly four years now, first enrolling in what would have been ninth grade, the 2018 to 2019 school year. Prior to enrolling, I had spent my whole education career in public school. I am here today in front of all of you to present my thesis. In this thesis, I will be answering three questions. Why I came to South Jersey Sudbury School, what I have learned and accomplished during my time at South Jersey Sudbury School, and what I will be doing with myself after I graduate from South Jersey Sudbury School. And uh, just once again, guys, thank you all so much for being here and uh, sitting and listening to what I have to say. So, why I came to South Jersey Sudbury School. My whole life, I have felt different from everyone else, always feeling left out, always feeling like I didn't quite fit in. I was never seriously outcasted or terribly bullied, but it has been clear to me that I do not fit in so easily. I've always felt some degree of isolation and loneliness, longing for someone like me. It has taken me great time and introspection to figure out why I feel this way, why I feel that I have been singled out. My time in public school started at Blackwood Elementary School in Blackwood, New Jersey. My mother chose to enroll me here just for preschool, as she believed the program to be better than other schools' preschools programs, or it was free or something, I don't know. My time in preschool was the beginning of a pattern. Instead of making friends with children my age, I was always more drawn to adults and older people. It has not been rare in my life that my best friend in the classroom was the teacher and not any of the kids my age. During preschool, there was a teacher's aide present in the classroom. Her name is Anne. She's actually here today. She's sitting right back there and she's looking right at me. Hi, Anne. Thank you for coming. Anne and I, um, oh, I'm sorry. Her name is Anne. She happened to be my grandmother's neighbor, or rather my grandmother's neighbor happened to be a teacher's aide in my preschool class. Because of this happenstance, Anne and I were already familiar with one another. Her husband, Tom, was also my best friend. I spent a lot of time over my grandmother's house as a kid, and an equal amount of time was spent at the next door neighbor's house. Tom was and is like a grandfather to me. Tom was my first best friend, despite the 60 year age gap. He is the first friend I ever remember making. Besides Anne, I of course tried my luck with kids my age. I tried to make friends with them. I tried to connect with them over things that we may have had in common. I tried to play with them, but I always seemed to just miss the mark. I eventually grew tired of rejection and the feeling of not belonging with the kids my age. I may have even run out of kids to try to befriend. I gave up and decided that it was easier to turn to the teacher's aide who I was already familiar with. Anne would become my closest and one of my only friends at preschool. Eventually my time in preschool came to an end. Once I graduated, it was time to go to a different school. As I was only at Blackwood Elementary School for the preschool program, my mother transferred me into Gloucester Township Elementary School, also located in Blackwood, New Jersey. I don't remember the fine details of kindergarten so well, but I can say with certainty the pattern continued. Although I had now found myself a few friends my age, they were not very close friends. They always connected with one another better than they connected with me. And I was never invited to play dates outside of school. I always felt they accepted, oh, oh I'm sorry about that. Uh, I always felt like they accepted one another more than they accepted me. I was always made to feel like an afterthought, the third wheel. I once again befriended the adult in the room. Now at this point, you may believe that I was a teacher's pet, but that was not the case. Yes, a teacher was almost always my closest or only friend in the classroom. While I often didn't have much of a choice, I did get along well with adults and didn't mind being friends with the teacher. Though, at the same time, for my whole life, I have not responded well to authority. I was never really a troublemaker, but I responded especially badly to schoolwork and academics. You see, I have ADHD. My parents have known this for my whole life. 
was painfully obvious from a young age. I could never sit still, never shut up, and I had a very hard time staying on task, especially with things I did not want to do, and always had energy to spare as well. I have memories of sitting at my grandmother's kitchen table with homework in front of me for hours, the clock almost always reading times long past when I started my task. It seemed, <coughs> excuse me, it seemed that no matter how hard anyone tried, if I was not interested in what I was doing, it was not going to get done very fast, if at all. Doing work in school was, always, uh, was also a challenge, but it cannot be understated how difficult it was to get me to do my homework. I couldn't care less about it. I had great difficulty in starting it and actually staying on task, and I eventually grew to hate it more than anything else about school. Instead of my ADHD receiving proper attention or treatment, I was always just told, you have ADHD. And that was it. That was all I ever got. No treatments, no doctors, no medications, no special, no special treatment or extra attention in school until it was far, far, far too late. It was painfully clear that special attention is what I so desperately needed, but by the time I did receive medical attention, I was already in the second half of my eighth grade school year, which was my last year in public school. Public school was a near constant downward, downward spiral for me. Each year I would fail to make many, if any, friends, be drawn to the adults in the room, and absolutely resent doing my academics. It always made for an interesting dynamic being so close to the teacher, yet always failing to turn in homework or do assignments on time. It seemed that I could talk and talk and talk for days, but as soon as it came time to do schoolwork, it wasn't happening. My whole life I've been told, you are so smart, you are so special, why do you not apply yourself? That comment hurts, it really does. I love learning, I'm a very curious person by nature. I always have them. All these things, the feelings of being an outcast, feelings of being picked on by my peers, feelings of being picked on by the adults in my life for not being good enough, feeling misunderstood, left out, left behind. It sowed the seeds of a deep hatred for academics and an even greater distrust and disdain for authority. At the end of third grade, my time at Gloucester Township Elementary School had come to an end. My mother decided that she and I were going to move to Haddonfield for the better schools. I didn't care about the school, uh, better schools. Uh, better schools was and is an oxymoron to me. In my mind, there is no such thing as a good public school. At that point, at this point, I largely hated public school and there was a little solace in it for me. I cannot tell you how many times I had cried while being screamed at by an adult to get my work done. The work that was being, the work that was meaningless to me, being forced upon me by misunderstanding, mean, cruel adults. Haddonfield is a very preppy, very wealthy, very clicky town. Being a newcomer here was and is not easy. I appreciated the fresh start, but I was not optimistic. The school building was so old, so prison-like and dark. I knew I was trapped there. I knew the building was designed with the specific purpose of keeping children in. I still remember walking into the fourth grade classroom for the first time. I was not yet enrolled in the school and my mom and I were taking a tour of the building. Our tour guide decided to bring us by the class that I was going to be placed in and introducing me to everyone. Seeing all of my new peers for the first time was refreshing but also intimidating. These people have known each other for their, for their whole lives, and here I am, fresh meat. Despite all my misfortune, <clears throat> despite all my misfortune, I have always been anything but shy. I have often been described as a social butterfly. I had no fear in approaching people, but at this point my expectations were low. Eventually the first day of school came and went. I had actually found more success than I was used to. People seemed curious about me, interesting in getting to know me. I was even invited to hang out at a few kids' homes. Unfortunately, nothing seemed to stick, and I was once again dubbed the weird kid and an outcast. The teacher became my best friend, and yet another miserable year came and went. Fifth grade was much of the same. I was no longer the new kid, but my reputation was still not very good. I had made a few friends at this point, but none of them were very close, and I seldom hung out with people outside of school. The only solace in my social life were my friends I had made online through video games. Many of these people are still my friends today, some of them being my most loyal and long-lasting friendships. I somehow always managed to have good grades. Whether it was from sheer luck or intense last-minute crunches cast upon me by my own procrastination, I managed decent grades. Unfortunately, in middle school, this all changed. The workload became too difficult and too large for myself to handle. I was very jaded by this point. Homework was piling up, projects were not being done, and the scolding from authorities in my life grew ever more harsh. I had always, met, always managed to put up with all the struggles I faced in public school. Part of it was because I managed to take solace in my decent grades. Once they started to slip, I had nothing to hold on to in public school. I, in particular, struggled, uh, struggled greatly with mathematics. Often, af only after enrolling in Sudbury did I learn I suffer from dyscalculate. Uh, 
His calcula is a learning deficit with math and numbers. I have always been very slow with math, but it is, uh, it is when I started taking algebra in middle school that I faced extreme difficulty with the subject. Once again, I received no extra attention or special treatment. In eighth grade, my mother did get me tutoring with a teacher at the school, but it was largely ineffective because I held so much hatred for academics by that point. My whole life, school had been nothing but rejection, being outcasted, misunderstood, made to do things I did not want to do, made to, think, made to do things I did not understand, being left behind, being scolded, and made to feel less. As I got older and started to think more, I could not stand the thought of being taught useless arbitrary subjects, a curriculum made for everyone, but not made for me. It was very clear to me at this point that I was not like everyone else, so why would I want to be learning what everyone else is learning? Being taught antiquated, outdated facts by an, out, by an apathetic teacher who just wants to go home is not very encouraging. In eighth grade, I asked my math teacher why we were learning certain things and what their use was in the real world. Her response was something along the lines of, well, you're not going to use this in the real world. You just have to learn it. The rage I felt hearing a teacher admit what I had known for so long was indescribable, nevertheless making such an admission about their own subject. By eighth grade, I was at my breaking point in serious mental distress. My social life was shaky and amiss. My school life, uh, my school work made me more and more apathetic every day. My home life was miserable and tumultuous because of the constant arguing over grades and homework. I hated my life and I felt that school was to blame. I felt hopelessly trapped. <clears throat> One day around late February 2018, in eighth grade, I was browsing YouTube when a video titled, You Do Not Legally Have to Go to School, popped up in my recommendations. I instantly clicked on it. The video was made by a YouTuber known as Boy in a Band, also known as his real name, Dave Brown. Dave makes music, music theme content and gained most of his popularity through a song he made called Don't Stay in School. The song's lyrics mostly focus on what we are taught in school being antiquated and unimportant versus what he believes we should really be learning. He wrote a short note in the video's descriptions that reads, I can't remember feeling so passionate whilst writing something in ages. I absolutely love a lot of subjects I mention in, I mention in this. Astronomy, particle physics, pure maths, but I hate that everyone is forced to learn them. It should be a choice. There are a million other things wrong with education, but this one stood out as the most obvious and most insane. I find his comment about liking these subjects interesting. He may have, mid for he may, he may have been more excited about them had he not been forced to learn them and instead allowed to discover them on his own. I, hold, I find this holds true in all of our lives. I also have not felt so passionate about making something in a long time. This thesis is very personal and important to me. Anyway, back to the you do not have to stay in school video. In this video, Dave talks about different schooling systems all over the world. He eventually lands on a category of schooling known as unschooling, which is the category that Sudbury belongs to. He talks about a few different types of unschooling before eventually honing in on Sudbury schooling, even interviewing a Sudbury graduate. At this point in my life, I was absolutely done with public school. I was beyond my limit. If something didn't change soon, I can't imagine what would have happened to me. I was not specifically looking for private schools or different types of schools to switch to. I guess I had figured that this was my fate and that there was no way out. But when Dave started talking about Sudbury schooling, I was mesmerized. How had I not heard about this sooner? No teachers, no grades, no classes, no homework. It was literally everything I had ever dreamed of. As soon as I was done watching the video, I instantly began researching Sudbury schooling. I was overjoyed when I saw that there were a few schools within an attendable distance from where I lived. I instantly came to my mother with the revelation and explained the concept to her. She was at first skeptical, but she too was of course very worried about me and my decline. She agreed to visit a Sudbury school with me and possibly let me enroll. I was the happiest I had been in years. A few weeks later in March, my mother and I attended an open house at Philly Free School in Philadelphia. I still remember the first taste of the Sudbury vibe. Everyone was so friendly, open-minded, and willing to answer absolutely any questions myself or my mother had. All of the students seemed so, seemed so genuinely happy and careless. I had been sold on Sudbury schooling the moment, my, the moment Dave's video ended, but my mother was still skeptical. But she wanted, first and foremost, whatever was going to be best for me. The tour of Philly Free School was an eye-opening experience for me. Even with me already being so gung-ho about Sudbury, I remember walking the halls of the schools, looking at video game consoles next to shelves and shelves of books. It didn't feel real to me. I also remember talking to a young female student. She was so well-spoken, so polite, so intelligent. She had only ever been to Sudbury School, and she was one of the most impressive seven-year-olds I had ever met. I was beyond sold. 
Although I was already so sure on wanting to attend Philly Free School, my mother and I were unsure about commuting to the city every day for school. There was one other school we wanted to check out before commuting. It was called South Jersey Sudbury School. It was located right here in Medford, of course. My mother and I thought the location was more, more convenient and the nature atmosphere was a big upside too. I remember prior to our visit to SJSS, in my research, I had found a YouTube video of Brian Folia speaking at Rowan, Rowan University on rethinking childhood. When watching it, I agreed with every word coming out of his mouth. I was so overjoyed to finally have found a community of people who feel how I feel, think how I think, share the same experiences I have had. My whole life had been rejection after rejection, especially in public school. To have finally found people who seemed so like-minded was one of the greatest discoveries of my life. Upon arriving at South Jersey Sudbury School, Brian introduced himself to us. I told him I had watched and listened to his speech and that I loved it. He and I instantly got along and seemed very like-minded. Once again, I befriended someone older than me, but this time it was for the right reasons. It didn't take long for me to decide that I wanted to attend South Jersey Sudbury School over Philly Free School. The atmosphere was much more relaxed. I loved what the founder had had to say in his speech. I felt at home in the woods, and there were many more people my age at the school, and the commute was better. Brian even offered to carpool me. The list goes on and on. Even without all of these upsides, all I cared about was that I was going to attend a Sudbury School. For the first time in my life, I felt at home, welcomed, op optimistic, and happy to be at a school. So why did I come to South Jersey Sudbury School? I came to South Jersey Sudbury School because I knew it was where I belonged. My whole life, I had strived to find somewhere where I felt welcome, strived to find like-minded individuals, strived for independence and control over my own destiny, strived to find somewhere that catered to my needs. The list goes on and on. I enrolled in South Jersey Sudbury School because it was perfect for me and everything I'd ever dreamed of. That is the first prompt. So we're going to move on. I'm going to take a short break for a drink. <laughs> this apple juice is really good. <laughs> Done. Okay, everyone. So this is a three-prompt thesis, and I'll move on to the second one. And that is what I learned and accomplished during my time at South Jersey Sudbury School. It is a common misconception that our school does not offer a curriculum. It is an easy mistake to make. Have, uh, it is an easy mistake to have this outlook. Being so boxed in our entire lives and viewing education in such an authoritarian, one-dimensional way, even I had this misconception going in. It is drilled into our heads from the very start that learning can only happen in one kind of system. It is very easy to view our school as more of a daycare than anything. Kids show up, they do whatever they want, they leave. On a surface level, this is basically what is happening at our school. But this is the, what the foundation of Sudbury is. Excuse me. This is the magic of Sudbury. Giving children the freedom to do what they want, giving children uh, the freedom to do what they want. It is amazing to, to me to see what taking away forced learning and providing a loose but powerful learning environment can do for a person. South Jersey Sudbury School and the Sudbury model offer the most intensive real world learning I have ever come across in my entire life. Public school did not help me figure out what I am good at and what I am bad at. It made me hateful and apathetic, killed my creativity and stunted my self-discovery and growth. It was not a learning experience. It was a constant stressful cycle of memorize, test, forget. Memorize, test, forget. Memorize, test, forget. I was given no time to figure things out for myself. At any attempt to do things differently or in a way that may be more comfortable or easier for me was always shot down. There was no room for creative problem solving or thinking outside the box that I may have used later in my real life. Everyone was just doing what they were told because it's just how it is. <clears throat> Upon arriving at South Jersey Sudbury School, you're really not told anything. At, uh, absolutely any questions you have will be gladly answered, but beyond your uh, bare minimum basic responsibilities and expectations, everything is for you to figure out on your own. Those responsibilities are 
signing in every morning, attending the announcement section of school meeting, occasionally serving on JC, and doing their cleanup job every day at 210. That is it. If you wanted to know what, what you have to do to survive at South Jersey Sudbury School, you now know. The rest of everything you'll be doing and how you'll be spending your time at South Jersey Sudbury School is completely up to you to figure out for yourself. At South Jersey Sudbury School, you are given nothing but time. Time to do whatever you want. To many, this may be frightening, overwhelming, and confusing. Many of us are not, being, are not used to being told, just do whatever you want. We are not used to this because, of course, of public school and the way our society is constructed overall. We are so used to someone at the top telling us what to do next, telling us how to do it, making sure we do not dare stray from the path that has been walked by countless others. In the Sudbury model, we like to think that boredom is good. It is boredom that is the catalyst of truly creative individualistic change and discovery in a person. Many new Sudbury parents fear that given the choice, their children will do nothing of substance, nothing constructive, that they will simply sit inside and play, and play video games all day. Not to say that even playing video games all day isn't constructive, but that is besides the point. For some, this is true. This is what they do with their time. But eventually, no matter who they are, they will get bored of this, and they will do something else. Man is a naturally curious creature. Man rose to be the most successful creature on the planet over the course of hundreds of thousands of years, not by being told what to do with a handbook, but by figuring it out for himself. At South Jersey Sudbury School, I have learned that when given nothing but time in the right environment, the true nature of a person will be able to flourish. We are allowed to be curious, allowed to solve problems our own way, allowed to create our own path, allowed to learn and discover the way that we feel like it and are meant to. No man at the top telling you who, what, when, or where. Only you and what you want to do. There is so much to be curious about at South Jersey Sudbury School. So far, I've mainly spoken about looking inside oneself, but there is much more to South Jersey Sudbury School than introspection. It, if it is not one's own curiosity that will push them to learn and boredom that will push them to change, then it will be their peers and their environment on any given day, at any point in time, one can walk through South Jersey Sudbury School and observe learning in all of its different forms. Observe curious children pushing themselves and one another to try new things. Observe an 18-year-old making conversation or playing with a five-year-old. Uh, scenarios that one could have never seen in traditional learning environments are played out day after day at our school. Mixing children of all ages makes for experiences that are hard to, to replicate. Children of all ages playing together, planning events together, solving problems together, debating one another, opening up to one another, creating things together, and of course, just learning together. Putting so many different people of different backgrounds, interests, and ages in one close-knit community exposes a person to much more than they would have been exposed to elsewhere. The environment at South Jersey Sudbury School is perfect for enrichment. We live, work, play, create, govern, problem solve, negotiate, and learn in a community of all backgrounds, all ages, and all interests, just as humans had lived for hundreds of thousands of years up to the industrial era. The way that, Sudbury mo the, way that the Sudbury model governs is incredible. Sudbury School is governed by a school meeting, uh, is governed by school meeting, a democratic meeting that takes place twice a week. The system is, is a direct democracy meaning all students and staff have exactly one vote on all issues. A five-year-old has the exact same power as a staff member. Staff members are not even viewed as figures of authority in our school. They're only there to ensure that things go smoothly, keep the administrative side of things running, and just to make sure everyone stays safe. School meeting handles absolutely all issues at our school, from the simplest of things, like whether or not one should be able to store their belongings in a certain spot, to things such as tuition, wages, who the school hires, booking field trips, and even expelling students. Absolutely every decision and change that ever happens at our school is made by school meeting. These changes are, may I say it again, made in a completely 100% democratic process in which all students and staff of all ages have the exact same power. In school meeting, meeting a person, uh, in school meeting, a person will learn real debating skills. If you want something to change, you're going to have to convince school meeting why said change should happen. There are many elected positions to run for at our school as well. If you want to win an election, you better put up a good argument. If you disagree with the change that your own friend is proposing or do not believe that they are a good fit for the position that they're running for, you're going to have to look them in the eye and tell them that you do not agree with them. 
This is a hard thing to do, but you will have to do it to get your way. If a student's idea or run for an elective position is shot down time and time again, they are going to be more likely to change their idea or improve their standing in the school community as opposed to being shot down in the traditional learning environment. You are not being shot down by a figure of authority who, doesn't, who you feel doesn't understand or is mean. You are being shot down by your own friends and peers, people who you know, people who know you. A person will be much more likely to change when the criticism is coming from someone they trust and like. The teaching power of school meeting cannot be understated, uh, overstated. <clears throat> Delinquency and rule breaking at our school is handled by something called JC, or Judicial Committee. JC is a board of three students who will hear issues of alleged rule breaking at the school. Everyone who is enrolled at the school will at some point serve on JC. Whether they are five years old or a staff member, there are systems in place to make sure everyone serves. It is crucial. From my time at Sudbury, I have learned that JC is absolutely the most powerful teaching tool that the school has to offer. There is, at the time of writing this of writing this thesis, an ever-changing 26-page long rule book that belongs to our school. At any given point, if a member of our community he witnesses or hears about another member allegedly breaking a rule, they are obligated to write a formal complaint for JC to rule on. Anyone can write anyone up, so long as both plaintiff and defendant are members, are, uh, so long as both the plaintiff and defendant are members of our school. When someone writes your name in Names of the Accused section on the JC complaint form, you have been written up. People writing each other up is not an uncommon occurrence either. It happens every single day, just about. People are written up for the absolute most procedural of things, i.e. Forgetting, uh, forgetting to do your job at 210, to more personal things like hurting someone's, uh, hurting someone's feelings or, dis uh, or disturbing someone's rights to remain peaceably. JC also handles very serious matters such as alleged violence and theft, all instances of rule breaking are handled by JC. When many arrive at our school for the first time they, and have JC explain to them, they are fearful of it. Over the years, school meeting has made an effort to move away from a punitive atmosphere in JC. JC is not a punitive thing. It is a learning tool to separate right from wrong, learn how to negotiate and problem solve and manage emotions and conflict. It is not meant to be scary, only to right wrongs. There are words that we used to use that we no longer use now. Punishment became restorative action and defendants are no longer asked if they plead guilty or not guilty to an offense, but instead asked if they take responsibility or if they do not take responsibility. JC is not meant to be a punitive thing. Um, oh, I have like a, just give me a second here. Um, JC is not meant to be a punitive thing. It is instead meant to be a problem solving and negotiation tool. Defendants are not allowed to be given restorative actions unless they take responsibility for their offense. JC must truly hear out, negotiate with, and problem solve with all parties involved. Restorative actions can be as simple as doing someone's cleanup job for any period of time or saying sorry to them, or as serious as a suspension. JC is allowed to assign absolutely anything as a restorative action as long as the defendant agrees to it. If a defendant does not take responsibility for their action, 99% of the time, they did not do it. JC will dismiss, the, dismiss them from the case. It is very rare that people lie to JC. It is ineffective and pointless. It is, if someone refuses to take responsibility for an offense that JC believes that they did in fact commit, JC may stop the case and bring it, to, uh, bring it before school meeting uh, in what is referred to as a school meeting trial. This very rarely happens and has only happened maybe once or twice since the system was introduced about two years ago. This is just how effective JC is at problem solving. It is very good at making people take responsibilities for their action. JC may also move to a school meeting trial if the defendant takes responsibility for their offense but refuses all proposed restorative actions. It is also worth noting that JC is required to ask the defendant what they believe an appropriate restorative action is before trying to come up with one themselves. The only thing that JC may not do as a restorative action is expel someone. This must be done by school meeting in a trial attended by all school meeting members. The defendant may or may not be present for this trial. What makes JC such an effective learning tool is that like school meeting, everything is coming from your peers. Every member of, of the school at some point finds themselves in every position in JC. JC board member, defendant, plaintiff, witness, it is inevitable. If you are a member of JC, you will have to work with your fellow JC members to investigate the accusation 
hear out the plaintiff and defendant is, and work through all of the possible emotions, negotiate a restorative action that is satisfying, relevant, and fair to, for both the plaintiff and defendant, and effectively come to a conclusion that leaves all parties satisfied. If you find yourself as a defendant, you will either have to prove your innocence or inevitably take responsibility for the rule that you broke, negotiate a restorative action that gives back to the community or undoes the harm that you did. If you find yourself as a plaintiff, you will have to plead your case to JC, list witnesses, and explain what rule the defendant may have broken. And if necessary, explain to the defendant how, and JC how they hurt you or your feelings. No matter where you find yourself in JC, the conclusion is almost always the same. Someone learns a lesson and the harm that was done is undone or made up for in some way. JC teaches real negotiation skills, real investigation skills, real emotional management, empathy, problem solving, and how to take responsibility and give it back. Uh, how to take responsibility for your actions and give back to those that you have wronged. My time at South Jersey Sudbury School has been the most intense, eye-opening, perspective-changing, mind-altering, introspective, self-discovering, enlightening, humbling, positive experience of my entire life. I would go as far to say that enrolling in South Jersey Sudbury School is absolutely, without a doubt, the best choice I have ever made in my life. The unrivaled freedom and time to do whatever I have wanted for the past three and a half years has completely changed who I am. I have since discovered so much more about myself. All of this time and encouragement to look inside myself in a judgment-free, positive learning environment has allowed me to blossom and grow in so many different facets of my life. There are so many groups I belong to, so many interests I have, and overall so many positive things that I have that have emerged in my life that I can say would likely not have emerged had I spent these past three and a half years elsewhere. Being given time to play and do what I want has been amazing for my mind. Sudbury nourishes the energy of creativity and discovery that lives inside all of us. Sudbury releases the shackles of the modern world and lets, and lets us learn how man is meant to learn. I am infinitely grateful for what Sudbury has taught me and what it has to offer. Besides interests and hobbies, the lessons and skills that I have learned and will carry with me for the rest of my life are irreparable. I can't say that word. Are re irreplicable in other environments. I have been called out on toxic behaviors and have had them corrected by JC. I have called out others on toxic behaviors. I have learned intense and rigorous debating and negotiation skills via school meeting in JC. During my time at South Jersey Sudbury School, I have been placed in some of the most intense, difficult situations of my life, made to make extremely difficult decisions, having to cast out people from our community, having to stand up to people, stand up for myself and others, preparing me to stand up to the world, and most importantly, allowing me to learn who I am and what I want. No one forced me to do anything, but instead it has been the ingenious nature of Sudbury that has brought all of this forth. Sudbury nurtured my creativity and free spirit, removed judgment and apathy, and replaced them with acceptance and empathy. It is my belief that Sudbury has truly prepared me for the world in a more thorough and better manner than any other place could have. At South Jersey Sudbury School, I learned to be a better person. That is the end of the second prompt. Short break here. All right, everyone. This is the third and final prompt. This is my future and what I will be doing next. I feel that some people expect a solid answer on the grand final direction that I will be taking my life and career in. I am sorry to disappoint those of you who may have expected an answer on my destination. I tend to tell you more about my journey. I do not have a known final destination that is besides becoming worm food. My whole life, I've never really stuck with one thing for too long. I get bored very easily. The amount of unrelated skills I managed to accumulate by the sheer volatility of my interests is huge. I've played every sport from baseball and fencing to karate and paintball. I've taught myself how to build computers how to work on cars and how to play many instruments. I've worked jobs in simple outdoor labor, working the counter at a pizza shop, and even a software in engineering internship. I now find myself working at my townships and municipal halls as an assistant in the tax assessor's office. If you really want a solid answer of where you will be able to find me for the next while, it will be in that office. Do I see myself working there for my whole life and making it a career? No, I simply don't. I stay there because the job checks a lot of boxes, and for now, I like it. The point I'm trying to make is that for my whole life, from a very young age, I have bounced from one thing to another. I have had constantly changing standards, interests, and needs. I do not expect this to suddenly change in my adult life. I continue to expect myself to be a jack of all trades, a master of none. 
I have obviously learned plenty about the dreaded real world. During my time in life, I know, uh, during my time in life, oh, I'm sorry. I have obviously learned plenty about the dreaded real world during my time in life. I know that life is not going to be easy. I know that life is not going to be a cakewalk where people are going to be extending their hands to me to offer help at every corner I round. No one owes me anything. The truth is, I have known these hard truths from a young age. Life has always been this way. Life does not suddenly get harder the second I turn 18 or graduate high school. These truths are a constant. We are foolish for thinking that our young have not already realized and lived these truths. I do not know exactly where I, what I will be doing or where I will be. I can, tell you that though, I can tell you though that right now, I want to create things, no matter what it be. Lately, I have been spending most of my free time working on various musical projects with various people in various bands. My creation is not only limited to music. I've recently picked up photography, another lifelong interest of mine. I also plan to soon learn how to create art in more traditional ways, uh, painting, drawing, etc. My time at Sudbury allowed me to tap into a very large creative force inside myself, a creative force that was for one reason or another largely snuffed out for most of my life. Right now, I want to feed into that as much as possible. So after this, my plan is quite simple, honestly. I'm going to work a job that I don't hate. I'm fortunate enough to quite like the job that I have right now. I'm going to work to support myself and to live a comfortable life. Whatever time I have that isn't spent working, I'm going to use to feed and grow my passions, to make them a reality. I do, I do hope to one day have worked hard enough to have made creation the biggest thing in my life, to have it not only occupy my free time, but to also occupy my work time. At Sudbury, not only are you set free, but you learn how to be free. I'm going to continue to use my knowledge of how to be free for my whole life. I'm going to spend my time on Earth wisely. We really don't get that much of it, and as far as we know, we may only have one shot at existence. I think that spending your life doing something that you don't want to do is the biggest, most unfortunate waste of all. To summarize, I'm going to be free. I'm going to do what I want. I'm confident that wherever I may go, I will be fine. I will find my way somehow, just like I have my whole life. I'm going to be working my best to be doing something meaningful with my life, to continue living like I have these past four years at Sudbury, expanding my horizons. I hope to die with a smile on my face, looking back at all I have done with satisfaction. Thank you all for listening. That is all. Thanks very much, Gavin. You heard your buddy. <laughs> 